it's remarkable how much of values are sociological phenomena. Commercial determinants of cancer medicines and non-pharmaceutical technologies. The pace of innovation and complexity in cancer is simply unrelenting. The whole cancer ecosystem is one of the most valuable ecosystems in the world from a business perspective. Radiation oncology tech and there's everything from a mask to image guidance. Don't assume everyone is bought, you know, you know, kind of leads us in crisis and cancer and you've got your institute. Don't assume people are bought into the idea of cancer control in humanitarian settings. Just first, any economists here? Who likes money? <laughs> Anyone not like money? Let's put it another way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So, you know, this is really, I mean, when we talk about economics and value, it's about money, okay? And, and I'll explain a bit more. There, there are technical details of assessing value, and you've heard of health technology assessment programs, but it's remarkable how much of values are sociological phenomena. They're set really from society. And, and I'll explain in, in sort of, not agonizing detail, but just sort of very broad brush what we talk about, mean about this. Um, I'm gonna start off by, by saying, just pointing you to two articles that were written, which got buried in some odd journal, wasn't it? European Barometer, or I can't quite remember where it was. Commercial determinants of cancer medicines and non-pharmaceutical technologies. I guess these were two pieces that we wrote with our, our friend Chris Bruth in, in Kingston, just looking at what we consider to be the commercial determinants of cancer. Um, and particularly from our perspective, because often we talk about the commercial determinants of tobacco or alcohol exposure, but particularly from our perspective, it was about medicines, pharmaceutical technologies, and non-pharmaceutical technologies. We've heard about AI, but also robotics in surgery, obviously all the new imaging tech and radiotherapy techs coming through. So these are kind of well worth reading because they give you an introduction from a policy perspective to this whole debate. So um, why, I guess, is health economics so important? Well, you know, you've heard the pace of innovation and complexity in cancer is simply unrelenting. You saw that graph before of the numbers of new cancer medicines coming on. You could repeat this for imaging, for radiotherapy, surgical technologies. When I started, we, we just had a knife and often the knife wasn't that sharp. Um, you know, these days, you know, minimal invasive surgery, robotics, the technologies around imaging, onca paint, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's unbelievable. And the idea you can stop it, who's this? Do you know who this is? Very fake, infamous king of Britain. This is King Canute. Yeah, who's that? I know, just Arthur. Yes, exactly. This was King Canute, who basically said he was so powerful that he could stand in the sea and tell the sea to stop coming in. And so the great sort of apocryphal story is he basically stood in the seashore, put his hands up and said, stop, and of course nearly drowned. <laughs> Which is the lesson? I mean, it's a very particular British lesson, but that's the idea of King Canute, is you cannot stop the tide. So innovation will keep on going, no matter what. Um, the business of cancer is enormous. Um, we buried some very interesting data in this paper here, what um, some team from Belfast led, just having a look at just how much money biopharmaceuticals generate, just looking at something called SEC filings in the USA. Now, in that sense, it's quite unbelievable, okay? But look at that, over a dozen medicines had returns of investment between two and a half to three and a half thousand percent. This is unbelievable, but go and look at the details because what's fascinating is there are some drugs which are blockbusters, by the way, and then vast numbers for which actually they're losses in terms of R&D. But as my learned colleagues already pointed out, the whole point about moving drugs on or technologies on is it pulls capital into the system. And so this is the point about the business of cancer, whether you're looking at cancer medicines, imaging technology, if you can't keep progressing something, you can't keep the money flowing in. But right now, even more so than kind of weapons and defense, the whole cancer ecosystem is one of the most valuable ecosystems in the world from a business perspective, no matter what sort of technology you look at. And of course, growing, you know, whether you look at middle income countries, there's a massive growing area. Um, the commercialization has also basically shaped regulatory and public e ecosystems. And what's fascinating is 
your public funding organisations, and I mean people like the NIH, NCI, the Cancer Research UKs, the DKFZs, if you look at their funding, it's becoming much more commercially aligned. Now, you can either say, well, that's a good thing, that's public-private partnership, or you could say, mm, that's a bit of a monoculture, that they're too focused now on discovery science and bomb pharmaceuticals, and the other areas that we've talked about in terms of research ecosystems are just being neglected. Now, we come, I mean, Andrew and I come from the, from the latter philosophy, because the view is, and I keep saying this to my commercial colleagues, is in order for commercial products to work in a service and system, you need public funders to support the wide breadth of research. Surgery, palliative care, radiotherapy, health services research, etc. And that is in a sense, there's a real danger if you get monocultures occurring. And of course, you know, we talk again and again, this is, you can, you can, some patients groups say, faster market is a good thing. Or, as I'm going to show you data in a moment, fast to market leads with greater and greater uncertainty about the economic impact and the clinical impact. So, again, it's a mixed picture. So, when I talk about the value problem in cancer, I want to start off by simply talking about something called clinically meaningful benefit. Forget the money. It's a question of whether the drug does what it says on the tin. And have you all heard of the ESMO clinically meaningful benefit scale? Is that a familiar scale? This is a scale that basically was developed, and I was in the original group developing this with Nathan Cherney, a way of taking the data from clinical trials and asking the question, is this really delivering clinically meaningful benefit from a statistical perspective based on the results from clinical trials? And bearing in mind, as I think Chris Booth has said, isn't it? Olympic tri cancer trials are for Olympic patients done in Olympic centers with Olympic quality care. So this is the best of the best. And by the way, the thresholds we set for clinically meaningful benefit were very generous. Some of us would argue too generous, but nevertheless, they were set. This paper by Nathan is extraordinary because it was a review he did of all the immuno-oncology drugs. It was, it's a few years old now, but you can see from Pembro all the way through to Devalimab, etc. And it asked the question, substantial benefit in the neo or adjuvant setting. So in other words, curative immuno-oncology, and then, of course, substantial benefit in what we consider to be the palliative or non-curative setting. And, and you don't have to be a rocket science here to see the dark blue and the light blue are drugs which are fabulous, okay? They're all the drugs you'll recognize. They are super, really? They're excellent drugs, and they do what they say on the tin. I'm not talking about their cost at the moment. When you get into intermediate, things are getting a bit dicey, okay? And, and a lot of us would argue, in those that sit in the intermediate category for the drug payer indication, you're really on the edge about whether this is delivering clinically meaningful benefit. But then you're into the grades ones and twos, and look how many there are, okay? This basically says, you're kidding me, this is actually not delivering clinically meaningful benefit for that type of can that drug for that type of cancer. It's not to say the drug isn't good in another area, it's just saying for that indication that it's got a marketing authorization for, the reality is it was given approval with what we would consider to be no evidence of clinically meaningful benefit. Okay? And this is the problem. So before we even, the value problem starts even before we talk about money and HDA systems. Now, the reality is when you look through, and again, this is, this is something that Chris has led on over in Kingston. We've worked with him for many years on this. You, you'll see here the thresholds that were set for the major solid cancers. Interestingly enough, and I'll comment about this in a moment, hemato-oncology were only just working on the clinically meaningful benefit scale because the judgment things are different. There's nothing for pediatric oncology because that's a different ethical set. And then there are ones being you're working on with your land, aren't you, on radio. Do you want to say something about that for a moment? It's a no <laughs> Yeah. 
the, the issue is the creep that's happening in terms of the threshold, isn't it? Right, right. So this is, I mean, this is not particularly welcome news to those who like technologies and want to drive through things because what it's doing is it's starting to illuminate that we do have a problem. Now, some of these are what I call general bio, genuine biological problems. In other words, the drug was never that good at hitting that target in the first place. Others are trial design. There's no doubt looking back on some of these, you look and say, that was just an awful trial design. And somehow it got through the FDA or the EMA routes. So it's a mixed picture. But the point is, it's getting a marketing authorization. So, but the, 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 the retort from colleagues is, don't worry, Richard, relax, relax, have a drink, sit down, have a blood pressure tablet. Don't worry about it because real world data will sort this out. It doesn't matter about the quality of the trial data and the marketing authorization. The reality is we need to get it into the real world and we'll do real world data studies. And then we will have the economic insight so that you can do your proper HTA assessments. Okay, I'll buy that. I'm, having, I'm relaxed. I've got a glass of wine in my hand. And then I get to see this sort of data that your man here led, which was a study looking at all the real world data studies in oncology. And we eventually got it published in the European Journal of Cancer and everybody ignored it because the message was terrible. It basically said, of all the real world data studies, 78% were low quality. They were garbage. And it, 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 you read this paper and you think, whoa, 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 hang on a minute. Everyone talks about real world evidence and real world data. And then you look at the studies that are supposed to inform HTA clinical practice. It's rubbish. You can't make any, you can't make head or tail of this. And I agree, isn't it? I mean, this is- Only two got the highest score. Only two. Okay, in every single indication, in every single drug we've looked at. So this, suddenly everyone's sitting there drumming their fingers thinking, uh-oh, we have a bit of a problem here. So the value problem, remember, it's, it is, before we even talk about money, the question is, does the intervention really deliver clinically meaningful benefit? Or should this intervention still be in the research ecosystem and not in general management use? And it all comes down to this problem of, of HTA assessments. What we're finding now, and again, I'm not going to go into technical details about this. In HTA, of course, we look at efficacy, we look at uh, tolerability, toxicity, which influences the quality element, the quality just in life here element. A country sets what we call a willingness to pay threshold. So 40,000, what's ours? 40 or 50,000 pounds for a quality adjusted life here, is it, or higher now? It's about 30. But it's about 30. With the new yeah okay yeah. so what we're saying is for and okay just a quick question how much is your life worth your total life how much are you what's your value of your statistical life hmm? give me give me a number in dollars dollars millions us here's this is what we work out how much do you think you're worth Should I? yeah, yeah. Give, give me a number of millions of dollars or Thousands or whatever. Thousand million. million. How much do you think your life is worth? Mm. There, there is some calculations, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, uh, so if I'm not mistaken, it was calculated to several like tens of thousands of dollars, right? Tens of thousands, okay. Anyone higher? Anyone <laughs> think? Okay, who thinks? How much are you worth? Anything needed. Anything needed. No, no, that's a great. So you think you're, you're priceless. Yes. <laughs> Good. I like it. Anyone? Anyone think they're worth? Anyone think? Anyone think they're worth a million dollars? No, no, no. Something like uh, two or three hundred thousand dollars. Calculating the the. the price. You're going down. <laughs> hey, what's going on here? He's gone priceless. You're going to get uh, two or three hundred thousand. Oh, well, this is a good philosophical point. I'm going to put you out of your misery. You're, you're worth between about seven and nine million dollars. The whole of your value of a statistical life. And of course, as you old, you go big hump when you're most productive, and then it tails off towards the end. Are men or women more valuable? More valuable. Uh, have, who has the higher value of statistical life? Gevold or you? Which one? Ooh. Controversial. Contro no, wait, just, 
is women. It is women. It's women. And by the way, men have to live to 98 before the curse cross. If you, you live to 98, you will become slightly more valuable than a woman. Good luck. <laughs> So the point being is, there's a lot of there is actually a lot of economic science behind this because it's about product, you know, I just meant productivity losses and gains, right? In HTA, that's what we're trying to do. But the problem in HTA it requires data, right? If you don't really know what the true impact on overall survival is, if you don't know what the true impact is in terms of tolerability and toxicities, a lot of the immunology drugs now it takes quite a while for the tox to come through. So if your trials are short and you start seeing some really weird, nasty stuff later on down the line that's going to cost a fortune to treat you, you know, mm, you're not going to pick that up. And so the problem is now, without going into lots of details, health technology assessment programs are getting harder and harder because they're modelling more and more of this, right? Because there's greater and greater uncertainty now when a drug gets its authorization about what the societal impact is. And so you'll see these terrible graphs with the quality, quality adjusted life here costs could be anything over between twenty to one hundred and fifty thousand. How are you, as a policymaker, supposed to make a decision? So, it, and and it comes back to this problem of value again. The standard value equations you've got to be very careful in multi-criteria decision analysis now and HTA systems. All of these bits have weighting systems. So what you'll see is now sophistication in systems which use HTA, like the Germans, the French, the Canadians, the Brits not the Americans, by the way, to try and make value judgments about whether or not a drug gets access and coming up with increasingly sophisticated methods. But it comes down to the evidential levels. And I think what's fascinating is the new biologicals coming through are getting harder and harder. And then you look at every individual ecosystem and you find that each individual ecosystem has very, very different views of what is affordable. So we in the UK, we actually have affordability thresholds now. So when there's a certain expenditures made on a particular drug and we hit the affordability threshold, we go back into renegotiation with the company about dropping the price. And be very careful because price, cost, affordability and value are just different ways of looking at the same thing. So it's just to, I'm just again, not getting into a lot of agonizing detail, but people will often use these things interchangeably and they mean very different things, but they are looking at the same sort of ecosystem. So it's important, the key thing I wanted to link this with the previous talk I did was, if you can do socioeconomic studies in all your research, that is the way forward. So if you can find a nice, tame economist within Yerevan, somewhere in Armenia, there must be somebody who can do economic studies within the continent. That is the way forward, because very, very few studies prospectively evaluate these things, do cost of illness studies, etc. And we need that, and that's not being done. And so that will put you ahead if you do prospective work where that's concerned. Anyway, just the last bit, just to talk more about the sort of broader economic environment for global cancers. There's more sort of a big picture stuff now. Um, it, it's fascinating when you look out there, all the stuff that's happening. There's a whole thing around um, the geopolitics of financing healthcare. As you'll be aware, and I'll show you in a minute, there are lots of countries in deep, deep problems with the financing of the healthcare. There is not the political buy-in to, to promote health. Um, secondly, inequalities are growing around the world. Thomas Piketty's book, if you get insomnia, read that second book. It's hard going. I mean, I've tried to get to the end and failed. Um, to be fair, he's a French sociologist. <laughs> I, I have, but I just nearly died. And I, I, to be fair, he's French and he's a sociologist, which, uh, you know, British French. Um, but it is very good. But his, his hypothesis that the world that is becoming less and less equal is correct. The data shows that. And even in countries which are supposed to be extraordinary in terms of their gene index like Sweden and Norway we're seeing it going the wrong <laughs> way and the final problem is this cost disease this is another terrific book Bill Bowmore who said look one of the big problems at the moment and he, and he used the, the the example of a Mozart opera okay a Mozart opera when in Mozart's time needed a certain complement of orchestra and singers right they were paid let's say one dollar each okay today you need the same number of people on the stage and the same number of orchestra, right? You can't get rid of the people. You can't say, we're just going to have one guitar or a keyboard. 
those people now have to be paid, I don't know, $100,000. So the point is that this, this inelasticity, human healthcare, it, we still need people. And those people's costs go up and up and up. Labor costs are going up. Now, what's interesting is, and he said, that's the reason healthcare productivity, you, you just simply can't make healthcare more productive with technology. A robot in the car industry will get rid of a million people, right? Because it'll do the job. A robot in surgery just adds more work. Do you, do you see the problem here? So costs are inevitably going to rise in healthcare and cancer care is probably one of the worst because all the technology is doing is adding to the overall cost of systems. Fascinating book, big problem. Very quickly, in a lot of the bottom 76 countries we talk about, we were talking about this on the plane over the way, National Cancer Control Planning, everyone talks about Sub-Saharan Africa, they talk about National Cancer Control Planning, say, in Cambodia. And then you ask the question, how much are these countries actually spending of GDP on their health? And it's, and it's that data. You see those two flat lines right at the bottom, which is just nothing. But the real scary stuff is the top one, and that's the debt to GDP ratio. In Kenya now, Kenya, if it's tax remittances that come in, Kenya is now spending just under 80% of its tax remittances on servicing debt. That is what's going on. And this is because the IMF, the World Bank hold debt, the Chinese hold debt, private countries hold debt. And despite the common framework and attempts to get debt relief, it's just not happening in many places. And so debt is being paid for from health and it's being paid for from education budgets. And, and this is general health budgets. We're not even talking cancer control. So you have to ask the question, as we were saying, is just how realistic is national cancer control planning in Zambia or the Democratic Republic of Congo? Really? Anyway, it's just to give you thinking about this. Underlying mechanisms and underlying health care systems are really important. The one exception is China, of course. We've been doing some work on China recently. It is incredible. I mean, this has gone We've never seen a country explode this quickly. That is the level of, of poverty in China between 1990 and 2015. And I'm not promoting the Chinese system here. I'm just saying it was just extraordinary what they've done. Um, of course, you know, military spending, everyone knows that's gone up. But it's just the sheer power of China in terms of monetary flows. And I'm sure even within Armenia and the region, you're feeling the effects of Chinese money now moving around. But in terms of changes to ecosystems, people talk about low middle income countries. It's a meaningless statement. You're equating China with Chad. Do you know where Chad is? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't go. <laughs> Trust me, I've been. <laughs> I mean, it's just, you know, these two countries. And, and it's just so it's a meaningless statement in global health and global cancer when you say, oh, we want to talk about cancer control in low middle income settings. Really? I mean, you, you're equating Armenia there with the, the wilds of Burkina Faso. It just doesn't, this doesn't computate at all. You know, it's very context specific. But China's been a really interesting bucking the trends model that's been going on. Um, and as I said, the fiscal headroom in many countries just simply isn't there. Um, basically, the color coding is red and, and, the, and the kind of orangey yellow is not looking good. So you see Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of Southeast Asia's in red. Um, bits of Latin America, although Latin America has been impressive, it's got much better, but there's still too many places where global financing is a real problem. And just to go into depth in sub-Saharan Africa, these are just different economic metrics, um, per capita, GDP, and this is as a percentage of, of government expenditure. You can see most of the countries are in red. Those that aren't at the bottom, that's South Africa. Um, to the left, that's what's that, Botswana. And then right at the top, that enormous one is, what's that's Morocco, isn't it? So, but broadly speaking, again, when you look at entire regions, you're looking and shrugging your shoulders and thinking, really, where is the money in the fiscal headroom? And I guess it comes onto the big problem that we talk a lot about, and there are lots of studies, and it's an interesting conundrum, It'll be interesting with what you think about this in Armenia, is this idea of progressive universalism and universal health coverage. How do you protect patients from financial toxicity because of a diagnosis of cancer or health problems? <clears throat> and people are really struggling. Um, next year, basically, at the World Health Assembly, the SDGs will be declared dead and UHC will be declared a failure because all the indicators are going the wrong way. But I think in cancer terms, one of the things we're constantly asking is this question of economics, is 
how do you protect patients for out-of-pocket expenditures? How do you create systems in countries which can actually pay for the care that you want? Uh, and just to say, there have been a few studies around, and there's some really nice methodologies on this. This is one from our great colleague, Namala Bhupati, who led the action study out of Malaysia, just looking at Asian countries. And, and people, again, ignore this because they just don't like what they came up with. They just don't like it. The bottom line is these are individual site-specific cancers, air, gynae, breasts, etc. The green means you were alive at 12 months and you weren't bankrupt, okay? Yellow means you, you were bankrupt. Financial catastrophe in this definition was you've lost it all. You've lost your house, you've lost your money, you've dropped below the poverty line. And red basically means you're dead. And most of those were dead and also poor which you can pop, can you be both dead and poor at the same time? <laughs> Probably can be. But this is not good data, okay? And then, you know, there were parts of Malaysia showing this. So again, st what I would say is there are some really interesting studies you can do nationally and regionally on the economics of personal financing that are really good. And, and they're not difficult studies to get if you cooperate with the right sort of economist. And just to sort of finish off, we've also done stuff in refugees, and, and it's fascinating because the numbers that come up and the costs for vulnerable populations is amazing. When we do the social science stuff, um, these are the comments we got from the UN. Unhelpful. It would be better not to know. So in other words, they're happy to pay for it as long as no one knows how much they're paying. Um, for one cancer total, we could treat a 1,000 pregnant women. <sighs> they're right. I mean, in that sense, what's the point? Most of them will die anyway. This is a waste of money. So don't assume everyone is bought, you know, you know, kind of leaves us in crisis and cancer and you've got your institute. Don't assume people are bought into the idea of cancer control in humanitarian settings. There's some really serious work to be done about how you set the economic and the fiscal argument for this going forward. So the last two slides, really, you get this amazing demand for innovation in the most incredible places in the face of massive fundamental deficits. These regressive out-of-pocket expenditures are becoming the norm, um, unfortunately. There's also not a linear relationship between expenditure on cancer and outcomes. And I do talk a little bit more about this month. Just because you spend loads of money doesn't mean your outcomes will improve because of the way that indeterminacy. And then something that Calypso Chalkido, a great friend of ours who started NICE International in the UK, is now at World Health Organization by the Global Funded. Big political analysis, which is political structures of reforms that are necessary. These are very difficult and they may be beyond the will of many governments at the moment. And finally, just to make a pitch for the kind of new services and system thinking, we're getting very keen on political economy, I'm just about learning what it is, although I go around talking about it like I know what it is. Um, it is fascinating, though. So it really is the it started as the political economy of health and welfare. But there's definitely a hard way of thinking of politics and money and how cancer care is delivered in any context. And they are this is an academic discipline. Um, and I guess... Final thing is, um, this is a, a Friday surgical ward round at Guy's Hospital. We like to get dressed up in Elizabethan outfits, <laughs> stand around the old operating theatre, <laughs> get the hat out, obviously, to indicate you're in charge. Um, but dissection, I think, is only half the job. And I think with academia, you, we are very good at dissecting. We're not very good at producing solutions. And I think with the policy stuff, and segue into Ajay here, doing the research, but then, okay, so what? How do you solution this is, is equally important. And that's it. Bit of a brief canter through. Yes. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.